So another kind of simple harmonic motion is the pendulum. All right, we love pendula. It is a mass on a string. Ah, see the little one letter difference there. A mass hanging from a string is a pendulum. And of course, the uh, pendulum we care about right now is the big one that hangs from the ceiling. Let me get everything else out of the way so we don't want to have any disasters here. Oh, we don't want to hit this thing. I can't move. It. Oh, I don't know what to do. Okay. Okay, so the pendulum is basically just a big heavy mass hanging from a light string, and we watch it go back and forth. And just if you watch it go back and forth, you can definitely get a feel that it's simple harmonic motion, right? It feels kind of sinusoidal like that. So let's draw our pendulum. Our standard pendulum looks like this. You got a mass here and theta there. And it's got some length L. And it might be moving at some angle. The angle is changing back and forth. The angle zero here, angle goes positive there and negative there, or vice versa. Right? So what we want to do is uh, look at how are we going to derive an equation for this motion. Is it going to come out the same? Is it going to come out different? from the mass on the spring, how's it going to work? So if you read about it in a book, it's very confusing, OK? So I'm going to clear, up, clear it up, maybe. Um, it's confusing because one is they try to warp it into like an xy problem, and then they make a reasonable mathematical approximation. So there's two things happening, OK? So the first one is trying to warp it into some translational problem. And that's a really bad idea, right? So what? What they're doing is sometimes people will say, well, let's just think of it as though it's only moving in the x direction and do some approximations. Well, based on what you learned in the last exam, if this were only moving in the x direction, would it go, be, would it go back and forth? It wouldn't, right? Because the whole point of an oscillator is it exchanges between potential and kinetic energy. So if it's not going up, there's no potential energy to drive it, right? The whole reason this is moving is because of gravity. It's not the tension, uh, multiple choice five, right? It's gravity that's pushing it up. Two people haven't taken the exam yet. Never mind. <laughs> uh, it wasn't really number five. It was, and it, the answer is tension. I don't know. So now I've confused them, and they don't know what to think. <laughs> I love spaghetti. OK, now, the, now they're really confused. It's moving up and down because of gravity. So we can't say it's only moving x and y. OK? And then sometimes a book will say, let's treat it in the tangential direction, but apply Newton's second law like we normally would. Well, the problem with that is you're saying, let's take a curved surface and treat it like a Cartesian axis. Well, you can't do that either, right? That's not a good idea either. But you do it, and you get the right answer. So that kind of sucks, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to do it the right way because we're all so smart, right? You guys are so experienced. We spent like two weeks on rotational motion. So why don't we treat it like a grown-up, like rotational motion? It's actually easier than all the crazy approximations they do to try to say, well, let's just think of it as tangential. Like it's, there's no need to do that. Okay? So if we're going to think of it as rotational motion, what is Newton's second law? Here we go. It's OK. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Some of the torques is I alpha. Oh, trust me. Trust me. It's better. Okay? So we've got to say, OK, we've got to think about the torques and what's going on. Let's do a free body diagram. Here's my mass. Here's mg down and tension that way, tension force that way. All right? Trust me, it's better. It's better. OK? What's the sum of the torques? We need the torque due to each force. And you say, oh, I've got to do components. No, you don't. You don't have to do components. Right? If it's a torque, where the first thing with any torque problem is you define the axis of rotation. Right? There's the axis of rotation. So you say, I need to draw the r vector, because it's from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. Right? So let's draw that r vector like this. It's clearly, it's a vector down the string at some angle theta. Its magnitude is l. We could call it the l vector if we wanted. And now let's draw the force vectors all tail to tail, right? Because remember, torque, you draw the r, the displacement vector, or the position vector, <laughs> tail to tail with the force. So the two force vectors look like this. Here's mg straight down, and there's tension that way. All right? Not too horrible. That is the two force vectors along with the displacement vector. And now we just calculate the torques, right? What's the torque 
due to the tension force. Oh, well, it's magnitude of L times the magnitude of T times the sine of the angle between them. So it's zero, right? Whenever a torque is right along a line that goes to the rotation, it's zero. The sine of 180 is zero. Uh, plus, now let's do the torque due to mg, right? Well, it's L is the length, or the length of the R vector. mg is the magnitude of the force and the sine of the angle. Well, that angle right there, it's directly theta. Look, you don't even have to do components if you do it this way. You don't have to think, what's the tangential force component mg sine or cosine? You don't do that. It's a cross product. By definition, you have a sine here. And now here's the tricky part that'll get you. Is it theta? Uh, it's negative theta. Oh, because you go from r to mg, and that's clockwise. So you would have to notice that you put a negative theta there. The chance of that affecting a problem is not high. We mostly do magnitudes. But if you want this to work out, it's good to put a negative sign there. Then you say, OK, the torques, that was fun. What about the i omega? What is the moment for a mass going in a circle? m r squared, right? m, what's r? r is l, m l squared. OK. And then what is alpha? Alpha is the second derivative of theta with respect to time. d2 theta dt2. Okay. So then you say, OK. Um, so then we're going to simplify it. This was 0. right? That was sine of 180 is 0. Sine is uh, anti-symmetric, so the negative sign comes out. And then let's see, m is going to cancel, l is going to cancel. I'm going to keep this over here. I'm going to bring this over here. And I'm going to say there's my negative sign minus g over l sine theta equals, and over here we have the d2 theta dt2. Okay? So this is what they're doing in the book, right? They're doing some approximation to try to say, well, it does this, and you get an expression that looks kind of like what we had for the mass in the spring. Remember the mass in the spring, we had something like, you know, uh, d2y dt2 equals, my, equals uh, uh, minus k over my, or whatever it was. I'm, that's probably wrong. Okay. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I'm screwing it up. But we're just trying to get this equation again, this, this equation that tells you something is oscillating. Okay? But this isn't it. If we had to solve this, so, so that was the first part. That was the dumb approximation. We now fixed it. Instead of doing something with tangential motion or calling it flat, we said, no, we'll do it rotationally. So now we're here, OK? So now to solve this differential equation, equation will be really hard, because we have to say, what function, when you take two derivatives, equals the sine of that function? And there isn't one, OK? That's, we can't solve that, right? There's no answer to that. So now we have to do the small angle approximation. Mm, sine of theta equals something special when theta is small. So if you get out your calculator and you go to, you turn it sideways so that you actually get the sine functions, and then you put it in radians, and you take the sine of one radian, you get 0.84. Ugh. But one radian's a lot, right? A whole circle is 6.28 radians. So let me take the uh, 0.1 and take the sine of 0 0.1. 0 0.099. Ah. When I put in something small, I get the same number back. What about point, 0.001? sine 0 .0099999, 0 .001. So when you take a really small number in radians and take the sine, you get the same number back. What if I put my birthday? 0 .04247, 71. And I take the sine of that, 0 .024707, it rounds up to 1. Okay? The sine of a small number equals the number. Right? Sine theta equals theta if... Theta is, you know, is less than one, a lot less than one, if it's small. Okay? But you gotta do it in radians, you can't do it in degrees. Okay? I could show you why that's true if we do a bunch of sines and cosines. It's pretty cool, but let's let's move on. I'm starting to learn what's cool to you. Okay. <laughs> Getting excited about sines and cosines, you know, things have changed. Okay. So if that's true, then we could say, I mean approximately equal, you know. Then we could rewrite this and say, let's rewrite this and say D. 2 theta dt2 equals um, minus g over l theta. And now that 
looks exactly like the equation for the, there's a negative here, the equation for the mass in the spring. The second derivative equals some constants times the function. Okay? So this is what physicists get unrealistically or sort of over the top excited about, is they try to find like one kind of equation where a lot of things lead to the same equation, and that explains why everything behaves the same. The reason the mass on the spring moves in a sinusoidal function, uh, fashion, and the reason the mass on the string moves in the sinusoidal fashion is because they both are driven by the same equation that has the same solution. Okay? That's what's cool about physics. So, that's, that's most of it, actually. That's, that's near the limit.